Hello, you're watching Dispatches from India by People's Dispatch, a show where we bring you the major issues in the country, what Indians are talking about and how this will affect the politics, the economy and all aspects of society. For our first story, we bring you a close look into the state of unemployment and its devastating effects. 22 million Indians have quit the workforce in the past five years, even though the working age population has increased by a massive 121 million. Just 4 in 10 people who can work want jobs and despite the drop in the labour force participation, unemployment among, for example, those aged between 20 and 24 has risen sharply. When it comes to women's participation in the labour force, the statistics are even more stark. Only 1 in 10 women in India is currently seeking work outside of home. What are the factors behind these troubling numbers? What are the myths around labour force participation? And are they even based on an iota of truth? Anindya Chakravarti, a senior journalist, examines the numbers and asks the question, have Indians lost even the hope of finding work? If fewer younger people are looking for jobs, obviously the unemployment rate should drop, right? Because who doesn't want to hire a young person? Who wouldn't want to hire someone between the age of 20 to 24 who have, uh, you know, a lot of enthusiasm, are willing to work long hours, work hard, and probably you can pay them less, right? So given that their labor force participation rate has dropped, as I said, by 11 percentage point, there should be a higher demand for people like that. Their unemployment rate should drop, drop sharply. But here is the unemployment rate picture for them. In 2016-17, 32% of them were unemployed, those who were looking for work. That's a massive rate, right? One out of three who was looking for work couldn't get a job. But what happened in 2021-22 when the labor force participation rate of these people has reduced, their availability reduced, their unemployment rate has risen to 48%. Half of them who look for work do not get jobs in this young age of 20 to 24. Now take the case of women. Now, as I said, that there is, and this has been going on for a long time because in India, uh, women's labor force participation rate has always been pretty dismal, right? And uh, this has been, we've been told repeatedly, even in the UPA period, that because people are getting affluent, women are withdrawing from the workforce, all right? And we can see that, that that's happening, uh, affluence or not. The workforce, people uh, from the la uh, active labor force participation rate, women used to be about 19% in 2016-17. 19% of women wanted work or were looking for work. In 2021-22, that has dropped sharply to just 11%. One would imagine that, again, just as young people, the fact that only less than 10% of women or just about 10% of women actually look for work in urban areas, less than 10%, they should find it very easy to get jobs. Right? But let's look at the unemployment figure here and how much more it is than men. So men's unemployment overall right, is right now is about, um, about 9%. This is both urban and rural. This is in 21-22. But that amongst women is 27%. Three times that are men. 27%. If you take urban areas, the unemployment rate amongst men is 12%. Amongst women, it is 36%. Again, three times. It is clear that women are not looking for work because they don't get work. Men can leave the village, come and work at a construction site. They can be itinerant workers. They, can have, they might have to travel for two hours every day to go to work and come back, for, for, live in the, in far away from the city, work in the city and come back. Women can't do that. That is the key reason they're falling off. The chart. That is the reason women are falling out of the labor force. Young people are falling out of the labor force because there aren't any jobs for them. This is absolutely untrue that they're leaving the labor force because active labor force because they want to study or because they're affluent. They simply don't have jobs. That is clear from their high unemployment rate. In our next story, around 10,000 Rohingya refugees have spent the past decade trying to live their lives in the northern Indian city of Jammu. Now they face displacement again. Since last year, the Jammu and Kashmir administration, which is directed by the centre, has detained more than 150 Rohingyas, including women and children, under the Foreigners Act. 
The panic and fear inspired by these arrests is prompting them once again to pack up and move on. Our reporter from Jammu and Kashmir, Anis Zargar, sent his dispatch. There are around 4,000 Rohingya refugees uh, right now living in uh, Jammu areas of Narwal and uh, Batindi. Uh, but recently, in the past few months, we have witnessed that uh, at least a woman, a uh, 35-year-old woman, was deported from uh, Jammu after she was arrested and then, uh, and then put in a holding center. And uh, she left her uh, chil three children and her husband uh, uh, behind uh, her and she was then uh, shifted to Myanmar. And uh, there are uh, around more than 235 uh, Rohingyas currently, uh, they have been put up in holding centers in Jammu. Uh, and uh, the officials uh, have told us that uh, their, their documentation is complete and uh, they might be any time deported back to their home country. And uh, this is the current. This is the, uh, currently the situation of Rohingyas who are living in uh, fear and anxiety uh, in, uh, in in Jammu areas. And many of uh, them have expressed fear, and uh, they have expressed uh, harassment from uh, some of the authorities who have been coming and detaining them while they are sometimes on uh, traveling to different places or working as uh, laborers. Uh, some of them have also said that. Um, the, 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 they might all, all be shifted at, or deported back to their home country, which is where they face uh, 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 an, a, a per persecution from the military hunter, the government there. And uh, many of these have been living in, in Jammu since 2008. Some of, have them, some of them have come after 2010 and anywhere any, between 2012 and 2014. Uh, it, since uh, then, they had been living uh, comfortably uh, as compared to their situation back home, and uh, just like the forty thousand others who had uh, who flew back, who flew to India, who flee, uh, who lived in different parts of ba uh, West Bengal, Hyderabad, and Delhi, uh, they were also living in Jammu areas. But since past year or two. Uh, their, their situation in Jammu particularly uh, has been has been made difficult by right-wing groups who have termed their presence in Jammu areas as a threat to security situation. And there we have witnessed uh, them, their, their uh, shanties, their homes being sometimes, uh, they're catching up fire uh, and they have, they have not uh, ruled out uh, the possibilities of sabotage. And... Uh, Right now, they, what is happening is that their leaders have also, their representatives have also told them not to travel, uh, make uh, too much, not to carry out too much travel these time, in, during this time, because it is when they travel that the authorities uh, arrest them and detain them, uh, and then ultimately risk uh, sending back, uh, ultimately risk of deportation. And this has uh, happened just uh, the recent, uh, uh, arrests, dissentence in Jammu have happened just after human rights uh, groups like Human, right, uh, human Rights Watch and UN have uh, urged the Indian authorities not to send these people back, not to send uh, these communities, uh, this, these people from the Rohingya community back to Myanmar where they face uh, huge persecution. Uh, but uh, officials have uh, been telling us that they are waiting uh, for the government nod uh, so as they can carry out their uh, deportation or carry out the final process so that they can be deported back. And finally, unprecedented heat waves across several Indian states, a war in Europe and attempts to recover from the economic impact of the pandemic and its lockdowns have come together to create a massive coal crisis in India. Despite the Narendra Modi government's very vocal claims on new and renewable energies, the reality is that this country of close to a billion and a half still depends on coal for over three quarters of its energy needs. It is a crisis that has economic, social and political implications. Prabir Purka, SR of NewsClick, tells us what these are. Every year in summer, we do have problems with supplying electricity to all the people, to all the places that need electricity. This year, we again uh, are in that problem, but this seems to have been compounded by a complete mismanagement of supply of coal to the power plants. And what we are seeing now is roughly about 8 to 10 percent power cuts taking place in the all India at the grid level. But in some of the states, because we have basically state distribution companies, 
And at that level, we seem to see some places spark us up to one to ten hours taking place. So that would be cons that is really a very serious situation that a lot of the states are facing. Underlying this crisis are two things. One is the fact that we have a heat wave taking place. This happens in May. This seems to have taken place a little earlier this year. But also the fact that there is a lack of coal in the power plants. And compounding this is the fact that those power plants which were based on imported coal are no longer functioning, but the cost of imported coal has gone up by three to four times. Now, if that is so, then supplying electricity to uh, to the grid for them is a huge loss because they have come earlier said they would supply at much lower cost. Those are the contracts it has. So they have just stopped supplying power. So this, of course, is a, a part of this is a result of the Ukraine uh, war that is going on at the moment. But the critical issue is that India does produce a lot of coal. So why are you unable to move the coal to the power plants? Why do the power plants have really low reserves of coal at the moment? Out of 175 watt plants, almost 100 plants today have are critical in terms of how many days of coal supply they have. And therefore, the mismanagement at the level of the government seems to be neither the railways nor the uh, coal, coal uh, producing companies, those who mine the coals, they coordinated among each other how the movement to the power plants would take place. And the key problem is the fact that the logistics of the coal supplies have collapsed. And now they're stopping essentially passenger trains in order to carry coal to the power station. This is a really, really classic case of not planning for what is to happen and not maintaining logistics, which is the fundamental task of the central government. Prabir also tells us what the impact of this crisis is on the working class. Well, if the power cuts takes place at the rate at which they are going, or if it worsens, what we are going to see, of course, is the industry also is going to suffer. So a lot of the industries which depend obviously on electricity will also shut down. And that is cascading effect on the economy and on the, on the working class of the country, the working people of the country. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back next week with more news from India. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.